This is from the Collect for the Votive Mass of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Eternal High Priest. O God, by whom thine only begotten Son has been established high and eternal priest, to the glory of thy majesty and for the salvation of mankind, grant that those he has chosen as ministers and dispensers of his mysteries may be found faithful in fulfilling the ministry they have accepted. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, good evening, everyone. It is uh, a great joy to see so many of you actually here. At the exhortation of my right-hand man, who really is a right-hand woman, who's sitting right out there, Donna Miller. Donna, can you stand up for a minute? I know you don't like to do that, but Donna, yes, you can applaud for her, please. Uh, we would not be where we are as an oratory if it weren't for Donna's assistance with me, and in truth, sometimes actually leading me, and then other times making sure I stay in my lane and do what I'm supposed to do. She has a very difficult job corralling me and keeping me in charge. But it was Donna's exhortation that we needed to do something like this because our numbers have grown since we first arrived here a little over two and a half years, maybe a little less than two and a half years. And then truthfully, because of the situation of COVID and oftentimes the disrespect that oftentimes has been shown to our Lord in the Most Holy Eucharist, a great many people uh, have come, have come because of how we celebrate the Holy Mass, how we most especially receive Holy Communion, but then they've stayed, and that's the power of the traditional Mass. And so Donna suggested, and I agreed with her, and it had been in my mind at the suggestion of others that even prior to this, it would be good to do something like this. And so, but I envisioned maybe 25, 30 people would be here, so to see 100 plus people present indeed is a, a, a great grace and a testament to the beauty of the Old Mass, which I will constantly be referring to throughout my presentations tonight and for the next two uh, Tuesdays. I chose as our opening prayer that colic for the, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Eternal High Priest, for two reasons. One, because it beautifully illustrates what is always prominent and even more clearly articulated in the traditional Latin Mass, and that is the theology of what it is that is being asked for, what it is that's being prayed for, rooted in an articulation of who God actually is. Along with then an exhortation, if you will, for something personal or particular for that particular day, or in this particular case, for the ministers who are dispensers of his mysteries. And it seemed also fitting, given all the attacks on the priesthood, that as we talk about the Holy Mass, and of course Holy Mass is inextricably connected to the priesthood, that indeed we would also pray for our priests as well. So, um, if you'll take your outline in hand, is everybody, again, if you don't have a copy of the outlines, they're in the middle aisles, both at the back and at the front as well. I want to talk through a little bit of what we're going to try to do tonight. I'm slightly ambitious, and I don't suspect we're going to get to all of this tonight. I do want to provide an opportunity for questions and answers as well each of the evenings. Uh, you are being filmed, at least I'm being filmed, but you're part of whatever this actually is. Um, because I believe we have as many people present, or people who want this, who can't be present, as are actually here and present, maybe even more so. Um, so what I'd like to do is just, for this particular night, begin kind of just preparing ourselves, prepping ourselves for a more intense understanding of what happens at the Mass of the Catechumens, which we'll look at next week, and the following week, the Mass of the Faithful, those two major divisions of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. We're going to do some practical things. I know there have been lots of questions like, what missile should I buy? Uh, when do I sit or stand? Things of that nature. I'm going to do some theology with you as well, because if we aren't rooted in theology, then actually none of this makes any sense. Some of this will be repetitious for those of you who are familiar with the traditional Latin Mass. Uh, for those of you that are new to this reality, obviously it will be new for you. But I think it, it bears uh, remembering that we can never exhaust the fullness of the mystery of our Lord, and therefore, even if you're hearing this information for the fifth, sixth, tenth time, uh, that's probably a very good thing. So just to kind of quickly go over the outline so you have some idea of what I'm going to try to tackle tonight. 
And then if what you anticipated would be happening tonight isn't, you can begin jotting down your questions. Um, and we'll try to do all of that. Again, bearing in mind that we, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. I don't want to get ahead of myself. So I want to begin with, and I will in a minute, but just to kind of outline here, the, uh, a little bit of a reflection of that quote that I put at the bottom of the flyer. And then I want to do some preliminary concerns of just some things that kind of help orient all of us. Posture, low mass versus high mass, an overview of a missile in general, and then specifically addressing which missiles you should buy. I'm going to give you two options to make it simple for you, although there are as many options out there in one sense as you want to hunt for, whether it be purchasing something new or actually purchasing something older going on eBay or whatever that might be as well. And then I'm going, to do, I'm going to do two things. One, look at the form of the Holy Mass. So the liturgical year, the direction of prayer, the nature of the Latin language, why we still do things in Latin. And then on the back, you will see, we'll look at theology. We're going to talk a little bit about that favorite phrase of mine called celebrated dogma. Because you know, brothers and sisters, prior to the printing press, there were no meetings like this. People simply went to Mass. And most of them would have been uneducated. They would have been unfamiliar with the Latin except for that which they heard uh, Sunday after Sunday or day after day. And truth be told, not everybody went to even Mass on Sunday. So even though people don't go now, that actually isn't a new phenomenon that people didn't go to Mass on Sunday. It's something that we uh, have been so used to in this country prior to the post-conciliar development or prior to the council that we've lost sight of the fact that that's always been a struggle to get people to come to Holy Mass. But the Holy Mass is indeed a catechism, uh, a catechism in a sense, perfectly uh, combined and perfectly prepared for you. You don't need, in a sense, to know or all of the other things or read all the other things if you simply come to Mass. That is sufficient for your salvation, which is why the Mass is crafted in the manner in which it actually is. And why, well, again, I'm getting ahead of myself. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what the prayers actually say to us uh, in terms of the instruction that they provide for us. All right? I'm going to try to reserve questions until the end because I have a lot to get through. I tend to, I think you know, I tend to talk fast anyway. I will probably talk even faster if you can actually imagine that. And uh, so if, you, if I'm going too fast or if there's something you want to uh, me to come back to. I'm happy to do that. Bear in mind, however, that it is being videotaped, and so maybe you'll just kind of let it wash over you, and then a few weeks from now, come back and watch it again and again and again and again. I don't know. It's not a movie, so it may not be that interesting. So, let's take a look at this quote, because I think this quote, and I put it there uh, as a way of engendering in us a desire to be here, but also because it beautifully and succinctly expresses what's happening at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. First of all, we must never forget that the Mass is a sacrifice an act by which the church gives to Almighty God officially and in the name of all worship, in the name of all rather, worship of the highest kind, adoration or latria, which is due to Him alone. In virtue of the supreme excellence of His divine being, from which everything comes and to which everything must remain. Therefore, the Mass is offered only to the three persons of the Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, again, because you are here, because you're either familiar or you have come to know and appreciate the, the traditional Latin Mass, in one sense this phrase will not come as a surprise to you at all, and yet it is extremely profound. Because although in the Novus Ordo Mise, at the very beginning of the general instruction, it likewise reinforces the nature of the Mass as sacrifice, it then has crafted a reality that oftentimes does not then, as a practical order, reinforce that theological point. So theology always becomes realized. It becomes realized, and most especially sacramental theology, in the execution of the sacraments themselves. Therefore, rites and rituals and prayers are not ancillary or accidental. They, go, uh, they are significant in that ancient axiom, lex orande, lex credende, the law of, well actually, or lex credende, lex orande, but relate that relationship between the law of prayer and the law of faith. They go hand in hand. And sadly, there is at times an absence in the Novus Ordo Mise of that clear articulation of the holy sacrifice of the Mass 
as a sacrifice for the sole purpose of adoring God. So there are two, there actually there are three things in here I want to draw particular attention to. One, that the Mass is a sacrifice. As the Council of Trent, which we're going to look at in a minute, uh, articulates, it's a representation, not representing, but representing. And again, that may seem like a a difference without any type of substance, but Trent uses that language intentionally. It is re-presenting, making available to us that which happened on the cross at Calvary, so that the merits of the cross have never been ossified or solely contained in history. Why would God have gone through all of the trouble that he did to suffer and die for us, only to have the merits of that work that he accomplished on the cross be limited in history? That's as far as it goes. He wouldn't do that. And the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, as Trent says, is the unbloodied representation of the bloody sacrifice of Calvary. The same priest offering the same sacrifice and the same victim upon the same altar. Of course, all of that beautifully coalesces in our Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, I'm going to be throwing out lots of stuff, and I've already decided we're going to come back and do this on a regular basis from now on. We'll just throw out ideas and things to talk about, because we're never going to exhaust the beauty of this, so there will always be something to come and help us kind of, um, kind of grow more deeply in our faith. So first, the idea of sacrifice. Secondly, Mass is about adoring God. <coughs> Excuse me. It isn't about how you feel. It isn't about what you get out of it. It has, in one sense, absolutely nothing to do with you individually. Now people get upset when they say, that. well, then why am I there? Or what am I? Because God, as it says, as the quote says, because of the perfectness, the supreme excellence of his divine being, he deserves the, the, the perfect form of worship and adoration. Now the beautiful thing about adoring God, the beautiful thing about the relationship that we have with him, is that God, in the perfect act of adoration, which is the holy sacrifice, the Mass, has also chosen a way to perfectly sanctify us. So we can talk about the two movements of liturgy in general, but the two movements especially of the holy sacrifice, the Mass, first, adoration, and then sanctification. You adore God, and in this perfect act of adoring God, you are then made holy. Now, on your part, the sanctification requires cooperating with grace. But this is why we need to be faithful to not only that which has been handed on to us, but that which we now have before us, so that we do give to God what is fitting and proper to Him, because He's worthy of our adoration. Now, the beautiful thing about that particular reality, so this is number two of the three things I want to point out in this quote, is that then it properly orients what it is I am about at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. I'm not there to be made better, to feel better. I can feel better, and I can be made better by virtue of the nature of grace itself and what actually is happening. So it's not to say those things don't happen, but the primary movement, your primary reason for coming is to adore God. Now, there are a whole host of implications then that go into that because the assumption is that you're also living in such a way and you have your own perfect, your own prayer life, rather, that not only are you doing this here at Holy Sacrifice the Mass, but your whole life is an understanding of God, God is worthy of our adoration. So let's, let me um, make reference to an Old Testament reality. I'll also be throwing out various books that you can purchase. I don't expect you to buy all of them or even read all of them necessarily. I will tell you the ones you really, really, really need to get, so that if you're going to say, hey, I listed 10 books, these are the two you need to get. This one, I, I kind of in the middle because it's Cardinal Ratzinger's book, The Spirit of the Liturgy, which actually is in the same title of another book, very thin book, by Romano Guardini, a, a German theologian. Don't let the name fool you. He's German, northern German, German nonetheless with an Italian name, he wrote a book called The Spirit of the Liturgy as well. But in Ratzinger book, Ratzinger's book, Benedict XVI's book, he talks about, he goes to the Exodus experience to properly situate the understanding of sacrifice. Because he says, when God goes to Moses and tells him to go to Pharaoh to let my people go three days journey, to do what? To worship me. We don't know until the fourth promise or to the fourth encounter, actually. There are four encounters between Moses and Pharaoh. 
Where Pharaoh is trying to negotiate all this, of course, the ten plagues come, and Pharaoh, he's trying to, we don't know until the fourth promise, and really until the Passover, the last plague, that it's God's intention to set his people free. Now, of course, because of who he is, that's precisely what he's going to do. But the very first time God goes to Moses, or God comes to Moses, Moses to Pharaoh, the instruction is to let my people go three days' journey into the desert that they might worship me. Now think about that. There was no promise of freedom. There certainly was not a promise of the law which would govern a right relationship between men and God and among men themselves. There was no promise of land or kingship. Although God indeed, remember Exodus begins with, he bent low and heard the cries of his people and he remembers his covenant with them, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But again, they don't know that. All they know is they're going to march three days journey into the desert and worship God. And then maybe walk three days back and find themselves enslaved again. Now, God would not do that. But again, one of the theological principles we need to keep in mind is that when we talk about things of God, that belongs to God. And then we also talk about things that belong to us. And so while we now know what actually transpired, the ancient Israelites did not know. And while God, of course, would never allow his people to remain enslaved, nevertheless, they did not know that. And so when God sets his people free, Cardinal Ratzinger goes on to posit, freedom is always about right worship. We are free to do as we ought. And what we ought to do is worship God in the manner that God himself has instructed us that he wants to be worshipped. And notice also that this proper adoration that is due to God then rightly situates how we govern each other and also how we catechize or teach each other. Adoration is that first movement. And so long before they received the law, long before they receive all of the rules and regulations that are connected to how they worship together ritually. The first disposition is adoration. You know, the ancient Israelites, they wandered in the desert for 40 years in part because of their ongoing obedience. And of course, God has them doing all sorts of things, uh, especially, I believe, in Numbers and Deuteronomy that don't necessarily, and Leviticus, it don't make sense to us. Why is God asking this, 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 and this? Because he's training them to be obedient. He's training them to be obedient to adoration, to do what we are commanded to do. Because only then, so notice what happens in adoration when it's properly oriented. It makes us obedient, it makes us humble, it makes us pliable. These are all perfect dispositions to bring to the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Obedience, humility, pliability. What does it mean to be pliable? You are molded by God, you are crafted by God. And then the third reality, which is not necessarily immediately present and really tangential to our conversation, is also the, the necessity or the reality of priestly life. Why? Because the priest exists for sacrifice. I'm not a cruise director. I'm not a social worker. I'm not a community organizer. I'm not your pal. I might be your friend, and I'm friends with most of the people actually in this room, interestingly enough, which is great. It's nice to have a room full of people who are friends and friendly. But my primary reason for existing is to offer the sacrifice that brings about salvation for you and for me. Everything else that I do derivates from offering that sacrifice. My governance comes from sacrifice. My catechesis, my evangelization, my teaching comes from the sacrifice. Now I bring this up, especially in light of what our opening prayer was, because Priests need to be reminded of this. We've taught, we have been taught, and I, this is instruction I received as well, more about our lives as community organizers, being good businessmen, being good organizers, being on top of all the kind of material, temporal realities connected to the life of a parish and the life of a priest, and not enough emphasis on the purpose of the priest is to offer this sacrifice which perfectly gives praise to God because God is simply worthy of my praise. Okay, everybody good? So this is kind of get us going, get your juices flowing. If you aren't interested now, you probably just want to go home and watch Netflix or something, so, or whatever it is that you do to, to occupy your time.
I'm going to make, I'm going to deal with this letter B very quickly. Uh, this conversation between the Novus Ordo Mise and the traditional Latin Mass. I will be saying some things about the Novus Ordo Mise in terms of critique. Um, but I really don't want us to get bogged down into one is better than the other, although I think you could make an argument of superiority. And as I was looking at my notes, actually that's probably what I'm going to end up doing anyway, so I'm kind of betraying the thing I'm saying I'm not going to do, I'm actually going to end up doing anyway. But it seems good, since I'm being taped, that if anybody watches this, I at least threw out something like, yeah, he's not one of those really radical traditionalists that hates the Novus Ordo. I don't. Uh, actually, I'm a priest because of the Novus Ordo. So I wouldn't be one if it were not for my experiences of celebrating the Holy Sacrifice to the Mass. A lot of factors went into that when I was a young man, 40 plus years ago, even longer than that now, of how Mass was celebrated then differently from how it's celebrated now in the Novus Ordo Mise. But as traditionalists, we really don't need to spend a lot of energy worrying about all the things that are wrong with the Novus Ordo, because we're here. Whether we came here because we recognize all the things that were absent and difficult, whether we drifted here through relationship, whether we came here because this is one of the few places you can still receive communion on the tongue without any type of machinations and jumping through hoops and spraying yourself down with a hazmat suit, all the other things that are going on in the COVID reality. Whatever brought you here, whatever has helped you stay, that's where your energies need to be. That's where your focus needs to be. One of the things that I have loved about being rector of the oratory, and the list continues to grow, is that I basically I've had to go back to school. And all the theology that I learned, actually I learned a lot of theology. I am a licensed theologian in the Roman Catholic Church, so I know a lot. But I don't know a lot. What I do know now is that there's 1,900 and let's say 65, just to pick a number, of years of tradition and writing and reflecting that I now get to go back and read again. So that library that many of you have seen in my room is slowly but surely being replaced with all of these things. I'm buying traditional books and I'm raiding old nuns, convents, libraries in case they're getting ready to throw stuff away so I can get my hands back on all of this stuff that was so clear, unequivocal in its presentation of the faith and presentation of the truth. So, letter C under Roman numeral one. We're making a good, we're good. We're doing okay. I describe what we're doing here as a beginning and an ending and a continuance. It is a beginning because consequently we're starting what we know are going to be three days of conversations about uh, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. But also it could be an ending insofar as when you depart here this evening and never delve further into the Holy Mass, you will know that the primary purpose is to represent the sacrifice of Calvary in order that we may properly adore God and through this most perfect form of adoration be sanctified. You never need to know all the things that I know, although you can know all the things that I know. There's no secret knowledge. We're not Gnostics. I'm, my purpose really is simply to bring together all of this and present it to you. And then I'll encourage you to go back, and so that's where the continuation comes, because what's going to happen is not only the continuation of these talks themselves, but each of these points that we're making, we could spend weeks, if not months, classes on all of them. And that's a good thing, to know that there's so much out there for us to feed on, to contemplate, to meditate, and to ruminate over. And what does that do for us practically? What does that do for our souls spiritually? That means we can actually turn off our televisions. We can actually get rid of the internets. We don't have to be on Twitter or Instagram or all those other things. You can pick up Aquinas. You can pick up uh, St. Augustine. and all. You can pick up Irenaeus and Tertullian. And those are just some of the early church fathers. You can pick up Hilary of Poitiers. You can pick up uh, Isidore of... I mean, again, on and on and on and on. Uh, Hildegard of Bingen, who is a wonderful spiritual writer. One of the few women who rises through all of the kind of uh, difficulties of being a woman in the Middle Ages and writing theology. Uh, Catherine of Siena and all of her ruminations spiritually. This is a woman truly who spoke power to truth. Or rather, let me rephrase that, truth to power. This Dominican tertiary who had no formal education at all got into the face of the Pope and said, get yourself back to Rome. Okay, folks, there's so much out there for us to feed on that will really actually take care of our souls. And I think, in large measure, then the anxiety of the world in which we live might actually dissipate just a little bit. All right. Before I turn to Roman numeral two, this, these preliminary concerns, I just want to delve in just a little bit more 
to a clear understanding of the nature of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And interestingly enough, I'm going to actually go to Sacrosanct and Concilium, the document from the Second Vatican Council. Because while everyone thinks that that was a radical document, when you actually read the documents, either in translation or in Latin, at least this document, and remember, this was the first document that was issued from the Council over those two, three years from 62 to 65. Um, and it wasn't accidental that they began here, because if you want to dismantle the whole content of the truths of the faith, dismantle the holy sacrifice of the Mass, because that's where they all beautifully coalesce, that's where they all come together. But this is paragraph 47 in Sacrosanctic Concilium, which reads as follows. At the Last Supper, on the night he was betrayed, our Savior instituted the Eucharistic sacrifice of his body and blood. He did this in order to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the centuries until he should come again, and so entrust to his beloved spouse, the church, a memorial of his death and resurrection, colon, a sacrament of love, a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet in which Christ is eaten, the mind is filled with grace, and a pledge of future glory is given to us. Now, I've done presentations on that one paragraph alone. Time doesn't permit us to do that. But there are some things there that I think are beautifully significant, especially at the beginning of what was going to be kind of a, a, a rupture with the history that preceded it. The language here, although in some ways a little bit more accessible than maybe the language from the Council of Trent, uh, is still nonetheless traditional language about the Holy Sacrifice. First, that it was instituted at the Last Supper, that scriptural connectedness, the night he was betrayed, that he himself instituted the Eucharistic sacrifice, contrary to what our separate brethren have said, that we somehow crafted the Mass out of whole cloth. What we do, we are doing at the command of our Lord. That's how far back this goes. While the form itself has organically developed, the content that allowed for that organic development has always remained the same. We do what we are commanded to do. Take Bless, break, give body and blood, bread and wine first, which become body and blood. And why did he do this? In order to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the centuries, to make available to us uh, the work of our Lord on the cross. And he entrusted it to then his spouse. So she, the church, has the responsibility, not capriciously, but nonetheless she does have the responsibility and legitimately the authority to help us better understand and make realize in ritual fashion that which the Lord himself instituted for us. And so one of the questions that's often asked about the Novus Ordo Mise is did the Holy Father, Paul VI, was he legitimately authorized to do what he did? That's not the question, because the answer to that question is yes. The question is not did he have the authority, the question is should he have actually done it? Because having authority doesn't necessarily mean we have to exercise authority. Again, that's a separate conversation. And then finally, what is perpetuated? It's a sacrament of love. Remember, the simple definition of a sacrament is a sign and cause of grace. It both manifests grace by a sign, something perceptible to the senses, but it's also a cause of that reality. So the Eucharist is a sacrament of love. Therefore, I can see love around the altar of sacrifice. I can experience love when I come forward to receive my Lord. But then it also, it, it, love himself comes rests in me. Love then is caused in me. All the more reason for us to be properly disposed to receiving our Eucharistic Lord. It is a bond of charity. Again, because it's a sacrament of love, when we speak about being united with each other, not only does the Eucharistic sacrifice bind us together, but it is the reason for us being bound together. Therefore, I don't need to know you. And even less do I need to like you, to call you my brother or sister. Because I call you brother and sister not out of some affective approach to those worlds, but I do so, or those words rather, I do so because of this bond that has brought us together. That's much stronger than anything that society could craft, isn't it? All of this energy that's being spent right now, while we're actually divided from each other, under the auspices of making us one, we need to be united, we need to be together, blah, 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 blah. Well, the real way, the only authentic way to achieve that is through one's participation in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. I'm going to repeat that. The only way to authentically achieve that is through one's participation in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. 
Now you can hear in that statement the call then to evangelization. Everybody needs to be Catholic, folks. We're far from done. There are a billion of us, but there are, what, seven billion people in the world now? So we've got our work cut out for us. And we cannot rest until everybody has what we have. Not because we lord it over them, but because we understand that authentic charity rests in this bond that is created first, precedes, made manifest in what we do, and then actually allows it to foster and to grow. It is a paschal banquet. It's eschatological. It's pointing us toward our future. For as good as this is, heaven is where our final destiny is. So don't get too comfortable here. Don't like this so much. Because this isn't where you're going to finish. Now, I hope you finish in heaven. That's the goal. Shooting for purgatory, at least I am anyway. But realize also the reality of actually hell. Now, I know we don't talk about hell. I'm going to look right in the camera when I say this. Hell exists, and there are people in it. Our Lady revealed to this, this to us at Fatima. Again, you see all the conversations? We're going to be doing this for years to come. There's so many wonderful things to talk about, to discuss, and unpack. And so our goal in this banquet we receive here, which is a foretaste of what actually we'll receive in heaven, there is a beautiful kind of relief at St. Peter's Basilica. It's hard to get to now because they've got it all cordoned off. But there's that meeting that you know of between Attila the Hun and Leo III. I don't know if you know this historically. But Attila gets to the gates of Rome, okay? This is Attila. He came from the east. He gets there. And Leo has his hand up, and he stops him. And we know historically that Attila did not come and sack Rome. But behind him are Peter and Paul, behind Leo. Swords drawn, eyes blazing in the power. And actually, Attila's not looking at Leo. He's looking up there. In St. Peter's Basilica, the mother church of Christendom, not the bishop's church, but the mother church, and at an altar of sacrifice. Why is that so profoundly beautiful? Because that's what's happening, this meeting of heaven and earth. We get to play in the fields of God. We get to commune with God because God has chosen to commune with us. And then finally, what happens here? Christ is eaten, not bread. The mind is filled with grace and a pledge of future glory is given to us. This is what happens in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. I want to, make one, I want to offer one more quote, and then we're going to delve into some practical things. This comes from the Council of Trent. I forget which session. I believe the session on the Eucharist is maybe session 14, maybe? I'll find the reference for you next week. Wherefore, our Savior, when about to depart out of this world to the Father, instituted this sacrament, so you can hear similar language, in which he poured forth, as it were, the riches of his divine love towards man, making a remembrance of his wonderful works. And he commanded us, in the participation thereof, to venerate his memory and to show forth his death until he come to judge the world. And he would also that this sacrament should be received as the spiritual food of souls, whereby they may be fed, we may be fed and strengthened, those who live with his life who said, He that eateth me, the same also shall live by me. And the Eucharist as an antidote, whereby we may be freed from daily faults and be preserved from mortal sins. It would furthermore have it be a pledge of our glory to come and everlasting happiness, and thus be a symbol of that one body whereof he is the head, and to which he would fain have us as members be united by the closest bond of faith, hope, and charity, that we might all speak the same things, and there might be no schisms amongst us. Um, it, it's difficult language to get through, but it's just as beautiful, actually in some ways even more beautiful than what the, <clears throat> the Council Fathers offered. All of those points that the Council Fathers offered are also present here as well that our Lord is the one who instituted this, that he poured forth his love for us, that this was indeed his memory. We're doing this in memory of him until, uh, uh, and show forth his death until he come to judge us at the end. It is spiritual food for our souls. This is something that's absent in one sense in the Council Fathers from Vatican II, and an antidote whereby we are freed from daily faults and may be preserved from mortal sins. The Preconciliar Church had a better facility with 
talking about and expressing the sinful condition of the human, first, of the human person. But then it concludes with this is a pledge of glory. It is the bond of faith, hope, and charity. So we might speak the same language and there might not be schism among us. All right. Any questions thus far? Any issues or concerns? We're doing pretty good so far. Everybody's okay? Don't be afraid. We're not at the end of class. So if you were that student who asked questions with two minutes left, don't be that person tonight, okay? Refrain from that. That's why I'm kind of asking you now. You know who I'm talking about. That one guy or gal that you're like, we're, the teacher's going to let us out early. 15 minutes. And all of a sudden, I have a question. Really? I want to go play. Anyway. No, you can ask as many questions as you want. All right. Let's go back to our outline here and these preliminary concerns. So some of these are just really information pieces that we're not going to delve that deeply into. We're going to double back on some of this when we go more deeply into the Mass, first of the Catechumens and then Mass of the Faithful. And again, brothers, remember, this isn't going to be exhaustive because it can't be exhaustive. We, there are literally volumes written on the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and the traditional Mass, both prior to the Council and then books now. By the way, while I'm doing that, I w I'm going to have this put on the website because I cannot pronounce his last name. I'll deal with that later. But this book just came out. It's called The Traditional Mass, History, Form, and Theology of the Classic Roman Rite. This is the, um, can you see that? You want to do a close-up of it? I love technology. You guys can't see a close-up of it, but when you watch it again. His name is Father Michael uh, Fedrovich, I think. I'll make sure this is available to you so you can actually have it in front of you. This, this is, it's like changed my world. I've read a number of books on the Old Mass. What I love about this book is it is so very clear. I feel like I'm posing. Um, it's very clear, very accessible. And so a great deal of my order and structure, actually, from this first night comes from following what he himself articulates in this book. So I don't profess at all to be original. I'm not. I steal from people all the time. So you're not getting any new thoughts, because new thoughts only get us in trouble. Okay. So let's talk about low mass versus high mass, so everyone is clear about that. The primary distinction is high mass is chanted, low mass is recited. But this is significant because high mass was actually the form of what Mass is supposed to be. This is something we forget because really even your parents and your grandparents who would have grown up with the traditional Mass would have only really experienced low Mass, even on Sundays. High Mass or solemn High Mass, which is actually the perfect form of Mass. So what's the difference between High Mass and solemn High Mass? They're both chanted, but solemn High Mass has a subdeacon and a deacon as well. There are more sacred ministers at solemn high mass than there are at high mass. Let me confuse you some more. Because high mass can also be called the Misa Cantata or the Sung Mass. But again, there are two basic forms, high and low. And then high mass can be talked about as solemn high mass, which is known by the number of ministers present, or the Misa Cantata. What's the Misa Cantata? The Misa Cantata basically is solemn high mass, but the priest assumes the roles of the subdeacon and the deacon as well. Everything is chanted. So our normal experience of the 1130 mass at the oratory is the Misa Cantata. And one of the reasons why most people in this country would not have experienced solemn high mass, and maybe not even necessarily experienced high mass, was because there simply was not the number of sacred ministers for solemn high mass to do this. It also requires trained professionals. People who have a knowledge of chant. We are blessed with a wonderful men's scola uh, that has opened up my eyes beautifully to the, holy, the whole beauty of sung mass. But it's important, why is this distinction important? Because it's important to remember that what we do at solemn high mass is what we actually should be doing every time we celebrate Mass. Now those of you that are here Tuesday morning at uh, 7 a.m. and the third Sunday after Epiphany required or recaptured, it's dark outside, it may even be cold, the last thing you want to do is walk into church and find a whole bunch of us dressed and ready to go with incense and all the good stuff that goes with Solemn High Mass. But let's not also lose sight that actually Solemn High Mass is, by tradition, the preferred form of celebration. 
and therefore becomes kind of the backdrop or the foundation from which we then talk about what we do either at the Misa Cantata, which is the solemn high mass done by one person, the priest, or the low mass, which is the mass that is simply recited by the priest. This will also become um, important to us when we look at the postures of the lay faithful, which we're going to do in, the, in a minute. I am going to address this, for, this issue between low and high mass and talk about this history actually probably at the, after the first of the year, because the history of how we arrived here and the understanding of organic development will also alleviate some of the pressure we might feel about where the church is right now. Liturgically, she isn't in a good place, so let's just admit that honestly. Um, but we have been in similar, not these specific situations before, and there is a remedy that is present, and that is obviously an appeal to tradition itself. If you will take out that sheet that has the postures for the lay faithful, let's talk about that for a minute. One of the things that I have noticed is that because we do have new members joining us, there are different movements going on. And so I cannot see you, but I can hear you. And because our least attended Mass is 75 people at our 645, when you move en masse to rise or kneel or whatever you're doing, I actually I hear what's actually going on. So let me make some preliminary comments before we kind of take a, just a quick look at this. I'm actually going to allow you just to kind of read through this. This is pretty straightforward stuff. We can actually look at it next week if there are questions about it. But I want to make some general comments before we get there. Because one of the things that needs to be remembered is that originally there were no rubrics for the lay faithful for the obvious reasons that I couldn't see you. So the tradition of uh, everyone always uses this as the canard against the old mass. Well, all my grandmother did was pray the rosary during mass. Well, first of all, I don't know why that's a bad thing, first of all, praying the rosary. Um, but that doesn't mean your grandmother, while she was praying the rosary, was any less connected to the holy sacrifice in which she was participating. I was in, I was in San Diego giving a talk and I was talking about the early Christian church. The, the, the theme of the weekend for Catholic Answers was the early church is the Catholic church. And my part was to talk about the development of liturgy in the early church. And of course I talked about especially ad orientum looking to the east or ad altare toward the altar. But I gave, a, as I do oftentimes, I'm not shy about telling people you've got to come here and this is the way, the truth, and the light. There I am again betraying what I said I wasn't going to do, but there it actually is. I can't help myself. Anyway, I'm on an elevator about 20 floors up with a lady who decides she's going to excoriate me. It's just the two of us in the elevator. Uh, I don't like the old mass, blah, 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 blah. I mean, she throws out, and that's what I'm just kind of listening to. I haven't had my coffee yet. I really don't care because I'm not moved by any of those arguments anymore. They simply don't engage me or interest me. But then she says something that actually kind of made my ears perk up. You know, my grandmother, all she did pray, and I'm sure her soul, I'm sure her soul was really not in tune to what was going on. And I said, Madam, you're going to tell me you knew your grandmother's soul? Well, I, 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 I. yeah, that's what I thought. I said, don't judge. You have no idea what was happening to her, what was going on with her when she was present at Holy Mass. And so, uh, again, we just need to guard ourselves against that understanding that even when people are doing different things, or people are praying their rosary, or maybe their noses are in their missal, uh, that doesn't mean they're not fully actively, consciously participating. That line from the Second Vatican Council, which has been used as a cudgel to get a whole lot of people in the sanctuary. There was no way, obviously, for the priest to know what was going on or the other sacred ministers for that matter. Therefore, there weren't actually developed rubrics for the faithful. Having said that, there are various traditions that have developed. And there does need to be, to the degree they were able to achieve it, a certain degree of uniformity. Why? Because first of all, when we come to celebrate this august mystery, we're entering into something that isn't about me. And so the same actions done by the whole congregation allows me to lose myself. It isn't just about me. Now, let me be very clear about this so there's no confusion. You certainly can bring your prayers, your concerns, your issues to Holy Mass. But if you decided you wanted to have a mariachi band over here by our Mary's altar during Holy Mass, you can't do that. Not only can you not have a mariachi band, just to be very clear, you also can't have one, even if you could have one, you can't have one over there while we're all trying to do something together here. So there is the sense of kind of allowing myself to be subsumed into something greater. The subjugation, if you will, of myself into this greater reality that is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. 
Uniformity is then is not mindless pursuit of being one, but allows us to remember that the sacred liturgy is not private prayer or the expression of my own personal piety. It is the reality that allows the body of Christ, especially the church militant, but the body of Christ to give fitting glory and praise joined with Christ who is our head to the Father and unite us more compl completely with the Spirit. With all of that being said, what you have before you then is a copy of the explanation of postures and positions that have been used here at the oratory. I had this printed. Uh, Frank, uh, I mean, um, excuse me, Ken and Patty Catalano, who I don't think are here, but they were responsible for giving this to me, and I appreciate them doing so. Because this is what Father Bede, who was the first rector of the oratory, gave to the community itself to help them kind of develop that uniformity. So, I'm going to encourage you to read it. I'm not going to, we're not going to go through it right now because that would kind of get us off course. But I wanted you to have it at the beginning, so as you read it, if there are questions or issues, we can address those next week or the following week. My final caveat to all of this is, even as we strive for that uniformity, let's remember that there will always be derivations from the uniformity that we're trying to achieve. Part of this will be because people are, are not familiar with the practice of the Holy Mass. It also will be because people come from different communities, different traditional communities, and therefore may have learned different ways of proceeding. I do not, let me be very clear, I do not want us as a community to get lost in all of these particular issues. I want us to strive for that uniformity, but I don't want this to be the hill that we actually die on. Because if someone decides to kneel when they should be sitting, or standing up in front of you when you can't see, you have the option of moving or just simply being quiet. Okay? So, that makes sense to everybody? We're good? I'm sure there'll be more thoughts later on. You're going to come back at me. That's okay. I'm ready. All right. Let's talk about the missile. The missile. Oh, the missile. This is it forever. Which missile should I get? What should I do? How do I use it? Well, first of all, in the pew is this beautiful thing called the Edmund Campion missile. A wonderful anonymous donor made it possible for us to get, actually, we bought all of them. These are no longer in print. We have all of them. So, I would tell you to go buy this one, but you can't buy this one. And you can't even buy one from me because I'm not giving them away because I don't know when they're going to print them again. That's why they're in the pew. And don't try to walk out with it because i got eagle eyes, okay? The, the, the beauty of this missile is this missile is just a missile primarily for Sundays and the High Holy Days. It does not have all of the other information in the other two missiles I'm about to recommend to you. So if you are not inclined to either spend money or to delve more deeply, and you don't have to be inclined to do so, having one of these in the pew is good for you to have. And all missiles pretty much have the same structure. Let's talk about that a little bit. So this normally, and I say normatively because it very rarely changes, there are a few pieces that are a little bit different, and I'll address the differences, but let's look at the commonalities first. So every missile usually begins with what we call the proper of the season, meaning those prayers that are connected to the season of the liturgical year. It normally begins with the first Sunday of Advent and goes to the whole liturgical year. Advent to Epiphany, to the time after Epiphany, which is very, very short, to the preparatory weeks leading up to Lent, so um, Septuagesima, Sexagesima, and uh, Quinquagesima, before we get to Quadrudesima, which is Lent, the Lenten season. I'll talk about that in a minute. Then we go to the season of Easter. Then we get to the season of Pentecost and the Sundays after Pentecost. That's the proper of the season. What you're normally going to find in your missal during the proper of the season are the three primary prayers, which are the collect, or the opening prayer, the prayer over the gifts, which we call the prayer in preparation for Holy Communion, and then the prayer after Holy Communion. The preparatory prayer is also called the secret, the one that the priest prays privately. You're going to find those prayers, plus you're going to find the introit, or in Nova Sordo language, the entrance antiphon, which is sung or recited at the beginning of Mass. You're also going to find the communion antiphon, which happens before the bread and wine are offered. And you're going to find the post-communion antiphon, 
which is prayed before the priest comes to the middle and says, Dominus Fobiscum et cum Spiritu Tuo, Oremus, and then goes from there. The reason why is that the prop the all, all of those prayers change depending on the season. And by the way, it is absolutely fascinating to spend time with each of the seasons reading over the prayers for the particular Sundays. If you want to do something this coming Advent, pick up a missal, this one or another one, or download them online, because a lot of this information is online, and use those prayers each week as your own private prayer. Because the church has done a beautiful job of imbuing these prayers, even the short ones, with, with wonderful content and theology. All right, that's the proper of the seasons. Then you get to the ordinary of the Mass. These are the parts that do not change. The Kyrie, the Gloria. Well, let me start in order. The prayers at the foot of the altar. Then the Kyrie. Then the Gloria. Then the Creed. Then all the prayers that the priest prays privately in preparation for Holy Mass. And then the Canon of Mass. There's only one Eucharistic prayer, to use the language of the Novus Ordo, uh, and that is the Roman canon, by tradition traced to the apostles themselves. We'll get into that conversation when we get to the Mass of the Faithful. After the ordinary of Mass are the proper of saints. The church is chock full with holy men and women, not all of whom have their own proper prayers for their saints' day. The proper of the saints are those saints who do, on their particular feast day, have their own prayer. So today is, was, is rather, the feast of Edward the Confessor. No, I'm not going to tell you that right now. It's going to just confuse you. I'll, I'll wait till we actually open up the book. I was going to say something that's going to confuse everybody. But, so he's actually a bad example of what I'm trying to illustrate because he actually doesn't have his own prayers. You would look actually in the thing that comes next called the common of the saints. So let me make, let me make this clear. The proper of the saints belongs to those saints that are articulated in the calendar, and they have their own entrance antiphon, they have their own collects, they have their own uh, epistle and gospel, and depending on the feast, like Our Lady of Sorrows, she has her own sequence, or the Seven Sorrows of Our Blessed Mother, she has her own sequence as well. So proper of the season, which is the liturgical year, the ordinary of the Mass, which are those parts that do not change, the proper of saints, which is, uh, involves those parts of those saints, actually, who have their own particular feast days and all the prayers and readings that go along with that. And then you have this thing called the common of the saints. This is for all of the saints who don't have their own uh, epistle, gospel, introit, things of that nature. The common of the saints fills in all that. So, today is Edward the Confessor. He had his own prayers, but I had to go to one of the masses in the back from the common of saints to supply all the other parts of the holy sacrifice of the mass. I'm going to pause for a moment. How are we doing? Because now we got into the minutiae, and this is when everything kind of goes off track. The theology is fun. It's great. That's where, I, that's where I live. That's my bread and butter. Once you get to the minutia, it can be a little bit... Because I have to remember that you may not understand it the way I do. I just take it for granted. Everybody gets this. Why can't you get this? Why am I explaining this to you? I get it. Why am I explaining it to you? So, questions about any of that so far? Yes. Yes. So, so the question, I'm going to repeat the question for video, is can I redo the order again? The order so far is the proper of the season, which involves the liturgical year, followed by the ordinary of the Mass, which are those parts of the Mass that do not change, followed by the proper of saints, which involves those saints who have not only their own prayers, but also their own epistle, their own gospel, their own introit, and again, depending, may have their own sequence as well. After the proper of saints, then is the common of saints, for all of those saints that do not have their own epistle or their own gospel, you would go to one of these masses for that as well. Okay. After the common of saints, then are those masses that belong to the Blessed Virgin Mary. 
There are particular Masses for our Blessed Mother for every season of the liturgical year. As a matter of fact, I can tell everybody now, the Orate Celi Mass, which is the Mass for Advent, will be on the 5th of December. I had to think for a minute. Because the 12th is Our Lady of Guadalupe and the 19th is an Ember Day. Why am I telling you this? Because the Orate Celi Mass was the most beautiful thing that I've ever experienced in my life. So this, is, this has nothing to do with anything other than I'm shamelessly telling you, if you want to literally leave earth and go to heaven, walk into this church when it's completely dark, lit beautifully by candlelight, and then reach the consecration at the precise moment the sun comes streaming through those windows. It's going to make me cry thinking about it right now. I cried the whole Mass. I cried when I processed in. I cried when I got here at the foot of the altar. I cried when I ascended to the altar. I cried through the prayers I had to chant. I was a mess. It's beautiful. That is the Mass for our Blessed Mother for Advent, Arate Celi. So there are circumstances, and again, we're not going to get too deep into this right now because there, there are a whole lot of things that even I'm now still learning. All right? So after the Masses of the Blessed Virgin Mary are then these Masses called votive Masses. What are votive Masses? Votive Masses are all of the other Masses that a priest theoretically could say. For example, I took the opening prayer for our uh, little convenience or, uh, this evening from the Mass of Christ the Eternal High Priest. That's a votive Mass that normally is celebrated every Thursday if there is an unimpeded day. You'll know that in the calendar, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to stay focused because I like to jump around. My students used to hate me for that because I'd have a thought here and the next thing you know, 20 minutes later, I'm on this other thing and sometimes I forget that I was teaching. I'd be looking at the board and I got all these ideas. Oh, wait a minute, there are 25 people out there waiting for me to say something. So I'm going to try to just stay focused here. These votive masses are, involve a variety. You can, the mass for famine, uh, a mass during time of pestilence and plague, which we celebrated here at the beginning of the pandemic. There are masses for the Lord's precious blood, his sacred heart, which we do every Friday if there's not another feast being celebrated. The Immaculate Heart of Mary Mass uh, can be a votive Mass. You usually take it from her feast day itself, but it's there. So there are a whole host of these. And again, this is common in most missiles you're going to find. What would be absent from the Edmund Campion Missal would be the common of saints, except for those few. Uh, actually, what would be really the proper of saints is going to be few and far between, because this missal was crafted for the sole purpose of allowing people who were at Mass on Sunday, who didn't own their own missiles, to have access to one. Okay, I'm going to go through the order again, and then I'm going to pause. The proper of seasons, then the ordinary of the Mass, then the proper of saints, then Masses of, pardon me, then the common of saints, excuse me. Check our time here. Oh, good. So again, let me start from the beginning because I made a mistake. Proper of the seasons, the ordinary of the mass, the proper of saints, the common of the saints, masses of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and then votive masses. Now, there will be from missile to missile, excluding the Campion missile because it's not in what I'm about to say, that will have further information. Some missiles, for example, have uh, a whole host of information at the very beginning to help you use the missile, to help you prepare yourself for Mass, other prayers, things that you should know as a Catholic, Ten Commandments, Beatitudes, precepts of the Church, sacraments, things of that nature. Some missiles also will include prayers in preparation specifically for Mass, but then also prayers in Thanksgiving after receiving Holy Communion at the conclusion of Mass. Some missiles will have the other sacraments, primarily baptism and confirmation, because those would be the ones that most people would actually be familiar with and see. But some may have all of the structure of all seven sacraments. So it really just depends on what you want or what you're looking for in your missile. So I have two of them here. And as you depart, if you want to come forward and look at them, you may. I use both of these along with the third one, but these two are my favorite. The first missile is called the New Roman Missile, subtitled Father Lasans, L-A-S-A-N-C-E. 
the new Roman Missal by Father Lasans. The beauty of this Missal is he gives you actually a beautiful explanation as to how to use the Missal itself at the very beginning. The print at times can be a little hard to get through, especially at the beginning, but get a magnifying glass. It's actually not that bad, but I got bad eyes. Those of you with the great eyes, don't worry about it. The rest of us who are getting a little bit older, long in the tooth, times it's hard to read, but it's a beautiful, beautiful book. The other missile that I would recommend is the St. Andrew Daily Missile. The St. Andrew Daily Missile. I'm going to leave both of these up here, so at the end of our session this evening, if you want to come by and take a look, take a picture and purchase them. I would recommend, although we put all of these beautiful missiles into the pew, I would still recommend you have your own missile. Because if you're a daily mass communicant, or on feast days, for octaves, just for your own edification, these are great resources. I would also, for those of you whose grandparents or great-grandparents may still be around, or their stuff is maybe in storage, you might already own one, and you don't even know it. And an older one is just as good as a new one. That's the nice thing about the church in the traditional reality. Things don't change. The more they say the same, the more beautiful they actually become. All right? Any qu- Yes? No. I'll repeat the question. I forget I'm wired up. The question was, if you get an older missile, is there something you need to, one that's already previously used, do you need to do something with it? No, you don't. Just, you might need to clean it up a little bit. You may need ribbons so that you can move through the various parts of it. But there's no, there's no blessing or anything you need to do in the, in, with that regard. Okay, how are we doing? Everybody's okay? Can you give me about 20 more minutes? Is all right? Do we need to stand up and stretch a little bit? Everybody's okay? Okay. All right. So, all of that was kind of preparation to get us where we are right now. So, I want to conclude this evening by looking first at what I call the form of the Mass and some of those attending parts. And then I want to look at the theology of the Mass if time actually permits us to get there. I want to read something to you, though, before we begin this conversation. This is in this book I told you about, the traditional Mass. I am not leaving this up front because I don't want anybody to accidentally walk off with it. If you accidentally walk off with one of my missiles, I'm okay with that because you all will just buy me a new one. But uh, this book I want to keep and I want it with me. But I'll leave it here for you anyway. All right. So, forgive me the long quote, but this is really quite beautiful, and it goes to the point we made at the very beginning, and that is that the holy sacrifice of the Mass is in itself a perfect school of theology. If you want to become a theologian, go to Mass every day. If you want to know what all these great theologians in the past knew, go to Mass every day. Read your Missal. Prepare yourself. Delve more deeply moment after moment. And again, the richness of this is that you'll be dumping into, jumping into a pool that will never actually end. You can never exhaust God or the beauty of his truth. So this is a, a, a reflection. He begins with Paul, Paul Claudel, the uh, philosopher, the French philosopher. He writes this, The liturgy and the zealous attendance of the church's divine worship will teach you more than all your books. He's writing this to a friend of his who was searching for the faith. Immerse yourself, he says, in this limitless pool of magnificence, certitude, and poetry. I'm going to pause for a minute. Immerse yourself in this limitless pool of magnificence, certitude, and poetry. And I would say of the three that is most needed now, it is the certitude. We need to be rock solid. We need to have a strong foundation upon which to move as Catholic men and women. And one's participation in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass talks about that. And then Father goes on to say, Claudel knew whereof he spoke. As an unbeliever, he visited the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris on Christmas Day in 1886. And within a matter of seconds, he left an unshakable, with, he felt rather, an unshakable certainty of God's existence and left the church a convert. Now, you may think that doesn't happen, but I can guarantee you it has happened. 
because it's happened even here. People who have accidentally walked into church. What is it that I just experienced, and how do I get this? We're here every Sunday. We're here during the whole week, and hopefully we'll be here forever. He didn't know a single priest and had no Catholic friends to whom he could have turned in order to be introduced to the Catholic faith. He eagerly read religious texts, and then he later wrote, this is from Claudel again, and again, I apologize for the length, but I think it is worthwhile for this to be heard. But the greatest book, so mind you, he goes to Notre Dame, he immediately converts, or wants to be converted, he is certain of God's existence, although he had been uh, an unbeliever prior to that. Then he said, but the greatest book that was pleased, that, pardon me, that was placed before me and instructed me was the church herself. Praise be the great and glorious mother at whose knee I have learned everything. I spent all my Sundays in Notre Dame, and as often as possible I went there during the week. Okay? So there it is. Go to church on Sunday. Maybe come during the week as well. In those days, when I was ignorant in questions of the faith, as one can be of Buddhism, the sacred drama unfolded here before my eyes with a majesty that surpassed all of my imaginings. This was not the miserable language of devotional books. It was the deepest, most magnificent poetry these most noble gestures that ever have been entrusted to human beings. We're going to talk about the silent canon when we get to the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, the Mass of the Faithful. Why is the canon silent? Because they're the most powerful words spoken on the face of the earth. They don't need to be shouted. These words that are able to change bread and wine into our Lord's body and blood. I could never tire, he says, of watching the drama of Mass. I never understood this, even when I was knee-deep in Novus Ordo land. Why everyone had to make Mass more dramatic? What's more dramatic than bread and wine becoming body and blood? What's more dramatic than God being present on the altar of sacrifice? What's more dramatic than God remaining captive in the tabernacle? What, what am I going to do with my good eye contact making sure I looked at everybody, with my perfectly modulated voice and my perfectly ordered homily. Really? Those things, I mean, don't get me wrong, you need good preaching. I'm going to come to a reason why you don't actually need good preaching, but I'm going to talk about that later. But I could never tire, he says, of watching the drama of the Mass. Every movement of the priest wrote itself deeply into my mind. That couldn't have happened in our current iteration, because each priest has his own movements has his own thing. He's got his own, he does, he does what he wants to do. But when you find a novice, when you find a traditional priest, a friend of mine said, to illustrate this point, he was with me before we started having daily mass. He came to visit me for about a week and a half. We had daily mass at our Blessed Mother's altar. He, he told me one day after breakfast, he said, you know, my senior, at one point I lost sight of you completely. Now he's sitting in the front pew, and I'm right there. So it's not as if, like, I was there and he was back there. I lost sight of you. I said, isn't that great? And of course, being the, we just started crying again. I cry a lot, folks. I hate to admit that publicly. Can you edit that out, please? Uh, we both, we just, but think about that. The gestures and the movements that have been passed down for over a millennia make sure that the priest doesn't become the focus. Christ becomes the focus. The drama of what's happening becomes the focus. He goes on to say, and I'm almost concluding, the celebration of the Requiem Mass, the, Christian, the Christmas Mass, the drama of each particular day of Holy Week, the sublime hymn of the Exaltet, next to which the most inebriated sounds of a Sophocles and a Pindar appeared insipid to me. He was an educated man. Everything forced me down in reverence and joy, in gratitude, repentance, and adoration. Think about those virtues. It forced me down in reverence and in joy, in gratitude, but also repentance, put aside sin, and a deepest adoration. This is what we're involved with Sunday after Sunday, for many of us day after day. And again, as a personal note, and I want to share these with you because I have said publicly in a small setting, but I will say this in a larger setting now, 
and for all posterity that in truth the celebration of the traditional mass and becoming rector of the oratory not only has transformed my priesthood but I truly believe it actually saved my priesthood. I was not in danger of leaving the priesthood that has never crossed my mind. It's not something that I would do even in my darkest hours. But oftentimes the mediocrity with which I was living my priesthood, the indifference to the holiness of those I was serving in my own holiness, how easy it was to be steeped and rooted in the world because it was easy to do so. The traditional mass simply through repetitious celebration of those things that others have done before me, slowly but surely, and there's still a work in progress, have stripped me away completely and totally. So, let's talk about the liturgical year and the beauty of the liturgical year. The beauty of the current calendar, and by the way, folks, the current calendar is as confusing a thing as you can possibly get. I have to tell you that right now. One of the reasons why I have, and by that I mean first class, second class, duplex, one, two, three, four. Uh, we actually are operating in one sense here at the oratory with the pre-55 calendar in one hand and the 62 calendar in another. Now, for those of you that aren't tratty nerds, you're not going to know what that conversation is about. But there were actually some major changes made to the celebration of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass from 1955 uh, to the 62 Missal, which is the one that most traditionalist communities use. That will be another series of talks that we actually won't tape because we're going to have to go down the rabbit hole for those conversations, okay? Don't wrap your mind around it now. If you don't know what's going on, you don't need to know what's going on. You're not missing anything. But it's like Neo in the Matrix. Red pill, blue pill. Take the blue pill, you're going to wake up and realize you're a battery. Okay, so just, I'm just saying, we'll get there. But regardless of which calendar you follow, what happens in the liturgical year, it is allows us to celebrate the mysteries of Christ and those of Our Lady and the saints who always draw us back to the mysteries of Christ. I began that thought about the calendars because one of the beautiful things about the traditional calendar, it does not allow us to get far away from, either, from any of the mysteries that we celebrate. I'm thinking especially of ordinary time. And ordinary time is an unfortunate byproduct of a lack of good translation. Because actually the better translation of ordinary time is ordinal time. It's numbered time. And in that sense, it's not substantially different than what we have now. So this coming Sunday would have been the 20th Sunday of after Pentecost. It's actually going to be the external celebration of St. Luke because it's his feast day and this is his church. But um, last week was the 19th Sunday. Then we'll have the 21st. We'll get up to the 28th. So those are the ordered Sundays after Pentecost. What they dropped was after Pentecost. They simply became, and then ordinary for us in English means just that. It's quotidian, it's boring, it's ordinary. No, these aren't ordinary Sundays. It's somehow lesser than the other Sundays. They're simply the ordered Sundays, 1 through 28, and then we pick back up with the ones from Epiphany. Again, I'm throwing stuff out to kind of both get you confused, to tease you a little bit, to get you to come back. Our lives should revolve around the church year. I've said it before, I'll say it again. The first Sunday of Advent is when you make your New Year's promises. Because that is your new year. That's when your life begins. And the rhythm of your life should be the church's liturgical life. And that is still possible even given the busyness and the craziness of the world in which we live. You can make a conscious choice to allow the liturgical calendar to be the rhythm of your life. If you feel at times that you are at the whim of all the things swirling around you, there is a degree of truth to that. But there's also a degree of, if you will, a certain degree of passing the buck as well, because you can take that back. We begin, of course, with contemplating the Incarnation. And then I, I love this especially because Epiphany in the current calendar, in the Novus Ordo, almost basically disappears. We actually get to spend time, because we are the inheritors of that star that those three pagans actually followed. We're actually the inheritors of Paul, but that was the beginning of making clear to us that the message of salvation was universal. 
It wasn't just going to be for God's chosen. It was supposed to be as it always was for everybody. And so here these guys come from the east with lots of money and lots of gifts. Who are these guys? And where do they come from? And why are they there? The thing is that they did come from the east, and they are there, and they're precursors to us. So from the incarnation to epiphany, to then that preparation for Lent, I love the three Sundays before Ash Wednesday. Because there's nothing more jarring than having a few libations on Fat Tuesday, and then all of a sudden it's, it's, it's Ash Wednesday. No, I need some time to get myself ready. How many of you have spent the first two weeks of Lent just figuring out what your Lenten disciplines are? Well, you lost four weeks, but imagine you would have three weeks prior to that to actually get yourself prepared. And of course, what the church does liturgically is she takes the Gloria from us. She takes the Alleluia from us. She vests the priests and the church in violet to remind us of that penitential reality. And again, if your life is being governed by the liturgical year, you would begin to do the same. Maybe in preparation for Lent, you would turn off your TV more. You would absent yourself from different forms of mediated communication. You would begin to fast. So by the time you get to Ash Wednesday, it's not jarring. Wait a minute, what am I going to do? And what I know. You're ready to go. So that season prior to Lent, and of course the Lenten season, the beautiful church's retreat. That's how St. Augustine described it. He was reflecting on the need of the Lenten season to prepare catechumens to come into the faith, and he said, you know what? Everybody needs to do this. We're going to have Lent. Lent leads us, of course, to the sacred triduum, where we intensely walk with our Lord to Calvary. There's that great, I think it's an anonymous reflection of, not in the office currently, I think it's in the old office, that tells us we need to be careful during the Lenten season to make sure that we truly are able to walk with the Lord, because for those who do not stand with Christ at the foot of the altar, The Paschal Lamb, once slain, becomes a rebuke. You don't get to celebrate Easter if you haven't done all of the hard work that allows you to actually get there. And then, of course, the Easter season, where we spend all of that time, those 40 days and nights, just simply contemplating that God loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be one with us, to suffer and die, that we might have new life. That then leads to the celebration of his ascension, And then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that brings us back to the season of Pentecost, that brings us back to Advent. The primary ranking of the days of the liturgical year are certainly Sundays, then feasts or solemnities, vigils, what we call octaves, and then feria days. I'm going to talk, actually that's as far as we're going to get to. I'm actually going to go through that, and I think we may pause for this evening, and I'll save some for next week as well. So of course you know you're familiar with Sunday, and of course you're familiar with feasts and solemnities, um, those connected to our Lord and those connected to Our Lady, those connected to some of the apostles, most especially in Peter and Paul. Vigils are a little bit confusing for us because there is this misconception, then it comes, of course, grows out of the current understanding in the Novus Ordo Mise, that vigils are those things that precede immediately the night before, where in reality, vigils began that way, but eventually, by the 14th century, vigils happened any time the day before. It's counterintuitive to us, because we think of a vigil as something that happens after sundown, but the whole purpose of the vigil is to prepare you for whatever is coming the next day. So the Vigil of Pentecost, have the whole day to prepare for that. Of course, we have the great octaves that we're all familiar with, the octave of Easter, the octave of Pentecost, the octave of Christmas. In the reforms before the 62 Missal, there were roughly, I believe, 16 to 18 different octaves. Now, this is where it gets tricky, because in some days, you would have the Mass of the Day, that saint, You might have two or three octaves that are overlapping with each other. And then you might have another prayer. You had to figure out which one outranked which one. Complicated. But the octaves allow for an extended celebration of a feast. And so while we have the whole Easter season, the octave of Easter is centered on the resurrection. Uh, We sing the the Victime Pascale Laudis. uh, uh, Every day that week we're required to chant it or recite it. It allows us to deliberately, and the church forces us intentionally to ruminate over that feast day. 
And then there are all these beautiful things, ember days, which are being rediscovered, even in the Novus Ordo Mise. These are given to us to assist us on a quarterly basis in renewal of life, a rededication of ourselves through life, and to do that through prayer and through penance. That's why those days are inviolate. The liturgies themselves tend to be a little bit extended. There are three days, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday make up the ember days. Wednesday and Friday, because those by tradition are even now in the old dispensation, those are days of fast, abstinence, prayer, penance, in a general sense. And then the Saturday was added as vigil in preparation then for the Sunday celebration. And so we just celebrated the Ember Days for this, for the fall quarter, which happened now toward the end of September, but they normally would have happened in prior to the reforms of 62. They would have happened immediately after the celebration of the Triumph of the Cross and the seven dollars of our Blessed Mother. Okay. That seems to be a, a good place. I know we're going to quit a little bit early, but I know you also want to have a chance to look at the books and things. And we have about eight minutes left. Are there any questions about any of the things I've talked about this evening? Yes? You talked about the Mass, and uh, I've heard it said that in, in the, at the consecration book, is, is that called the re entering into the sacrifice at the Eucharist? Or entering into the sacrifice? Well, the whole. So, so the question is, well, I'm not even going to read the question, I'm just going to make this statement. The whole sacrifice of the Mass, as sacrifice with all its attending parts, brings you to Calvary. There is, this would have been true in the high Middle Ages, so 11th, 12th, 13th, so probably 12th, 13th century, where they did an extensive kind of allegorical approach to the liturgy every single action going on in Mass, corresponding something either to the life of our Lord or to how we should enter into it. Um, of course, the consecration, the most sacred of moments, in a sense, is that reality that penetrates into this world, if you will, but it's the whole sacrifice. And why do I make that distinction? Because there, there it would never be a time Actually, a priest is forbidden to do this, where he would be able to consecrate the bread and wine without all of the other attending parts. So I, I only offer that not to say that if, if you experience that being at the foot of Calvary more intensely at the moment of consecration, I think that's a legitimate personal piety. I would not say theologically, and I stand to be corrected on this, but I would not say theologically that I would draw attention to that moment as opposed to like the whole canon of the Holy Sacrifice, for example. But then the whole sacrifice of the Mass, meaning the Mass of the Catechumens with the Epistle and the Gospel, and then the Mass of the Faithful with the canon itself. Does that answer the question for you? Yeah, I'm not going to tell you what you want, and that is that that is the precise moment, because that's what you, you led the answer you wanted by how you phrased the question. But I'm not going to give you that. People who know me well, I resist just for the sake of resisting, so I'm never going to give you what you want. I'm going to give you what you need, but I ain't going to give you what you want. Um, but I'm not going to do that because I don't want to go on record saying that because I'm, there's a part of me that kind of viscerally doesn't want to say that precise moment. Um, although, again, well, that's another conversation about the Epiclesis, because the Epiclesis, that time in the East where the, the priest places his hands over the gifts and calls down the Holy Spirit, that also could be considered the moment. And if you're Eastern, you do give more attention to the epiclesis than you do to the institution narrative. But then in the 17th century, in the 1600s, Alexander VI, I believe, finally said, stop arguing about it. It's the whole thing together. Move on. So, in deference to the Supreme Pontiff of ancient memory, I'm going to move on. Question, please. No. So the question is, if a priest has to go underground or go into hiding, I've already talked to you some, uh, some of you already about the room you're going to build for me, so just so you know. 
uh, can he, if he has no access to wine, can he celebrate Mass? And the answer is no, he cannot. But you know, and I preached about this the first Sunday leading up to Eucharistic Adoration for us, about the great priest, Father Walter Chiswick. He leadeth me. He talks about celebrating Mass with a thimble full of wine, a, a bottle cap. Now that's beauty. So he doesn't have to have a whole bottle of Mogan David. All he's got to do is have a little bottle cap, and that's sufficient. I saw some chuckles. You guys know Mogan David. Yeah, you're dating yourselves. We were drinking out of boxes, sitting in the park. Other questions? You're going to have to edit half of this. I can't have this as a public record. Well, that seems a perfect place to stop. So, thank you. I'm not sure all of you can be here the following weeks. You may have other commitments. So, eventually all three of these presentations will be available to us. I'm not sure if they're going to either be on our Facebook and or on the website. Once I know more of information about that, they will be. So, if for some reason you can't be here, you will have access to this other information as well. Please encourage others to come. Uh, we only asked for reservations so we'd know how many uh, handouts we would have to print, but I can adjust accordingly, all right? I'd ask you to please rise. In Dominus Fobiscum, Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis Patris et Filii, Spiritus Sancti, Descendet Super Vos et Maniat Semper. Amen. Go in peace.